I did find one property manager that does rent by the room. Uh, but if she goes away on me, now I'm stuck, right? And so I'm like, well, I want to, and I can still, every property I buy, I make sure that they will cash flow as a traditional rental, but the profits just not, aren't nearly as good. And so that's why I want to duplicate my passive income from Denver in North Carolina. That way, if Denver goes to shit, I still got North Carolina and I'm still financially mm-hmm. independent and I can still do exactly what I'm doing. This is the real estate investing experience. We get it. Real estate can be rough sometimes. And that's why we bring in the experts to talk about the experiences you won't hear anywhere else with your hosts, John Cohen and Chris Grinzik. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Real Estate Investing Experience. I'm your host, Chris Krenzig. With me, as always, is John Cohen. How are we doing? We're doing good. New year. Got some good news, I think. Starting to shake out our way. We had a rough end, but uh, I'm doing good. I got no complaints. We figured it out like we always do. Exactly. (laughs) As long as we continue to do that, I think we'll be okay. Exactly. We get it done in the end, but uh, a little bit rocky getting there sometimes. So Let's be honest kind of be boring if everything went 100% according to plan. That's for sure. If it all went according to plan, then, uh, you know, what would be the fun in that? You, you really want to tell me you don't enjoy those two-hour phone calls with sellers, <laughs> equity partners, brokers on a Saturday and Sunday? No, oh, no. Who, who, who wouldn't want to spend their time doing that? <laughs> awesome. Um, but no, it definitely, definitely looks like we're going to get through it. But who knows? Tomorrow, it'll probably fucking change. Hey, so hey, exactly. We'll be right back in the shit or sweating ourselves. But that's the, that's the fun stuff. Um, but let's, uh, let's not spend too much time. I was behind getting set up, so we're a little delayed. Um, but we got a good guest on today. You know, got a good niche, pretty deep into it. You know, has some good information, has a book on it. So I think it'll be really interesting to hear his viewpoint on, you know, everything. Um, but I'll let him introduce himself. So Craig, thanks for joining us. Yeah, guys, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So can you uh, take a little bit of time, uh, tell everybody who you are, where you're from, and you know a little bit about you and you know your real estate journey, history, experience. Yeah, so my name is Craig Curlop. Um, I'm originally from Massachusetts, so I'm a bit depressed this week. Um, I was just making fun of someone from from Boston <laughs> the other day. One of our equity partners. I said, "How you feeling? Yeah, <laughs> Welcome not, to being a Jets fan." <laughs> yeah, not not too great, but you know what? I'm I'm grateful. So hopefully, yeah. Anyway, we don't need to talk about the Patriots. Uh, um, but yeah, so I, you know, grew up in Boston, I went to school in Boston, went out to, you know, my dream was always about to California. So I got an internship out there while in college, then turned that into a full-time position. Did that for about six months, realized I hated it and realized I didn't want to be kind of sitting behind a cubicle, like, you know, working my ass off for someone, for some schmo to make 10 times more money than me. Mm-hmm. So I figured out, okay, like, how do I retire early? How do I do the things that I want to do? Uh, and I basically stumbled upon bigger pockets. Um, for those of you who don't know, Bigger Pockets is basically like an all-in-one resource for real estate investors and a social media site for real estate investors, just loads and loads of free content for them. So I basically just jumped into that rabbit hole and was like, holy shit, like this is for me, man. Like real estate, build up passive income through rental properties. Once your monthly passive income exceeds your expenses, you're good to go. And I was like, oh, it doesn't seem like that hard to do uh, in a relatively short amount of time. So, you know, I educated myself for a few ye- for a few months. You know, I, you know, got down to work. I ended up moving to Denver, got a job at Bigger Pockets, um, bought my first house hack all within like less than a year. And, you know, within three years of buying my first house hack, I was, you know, financially independent with enough passive income to quit my W-2 and um, you start, you know, maybe going into real estate full time. That's awesome. So I didn't realize you worked for Bigger Pockets. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so you're not working there anymore. Just, um, Technically I am. Yes. But (laughs) okay. (laughs) I mean, yeah, like I have the ability to quit and uh, it'll probably will be fairly soon just because my my real estate stuff is kind of taken over. So nice. So can you go dive a little bit deeper into, you know, the journey from, you know, realizing that the job wasn't for you because we both went through that as well. So I think it'll be interesting. And then to how you came across, you know, real estate as an option. (laughs) For sure, man. Yeah. So, uh, it all started, I tell you the exact date. It was June 11th, 2016. Like that was that weekend. Um, me and my girlfriend at the time went down to big Sur, which if you don't know, California is like this beautiful beach area of California that has like where the mountains meet the water and you just 
chill out there. We went camping, had a great weekend, just us. And there's no cell reception whatsoever. So we were basically just like cut off from the world. And that Sunday night was my last night with her because we were both moving away. And basically I got an email from my boss saying that, Hey, Craig, you have to get this memo out by 8 a.m. Eastern time, which there's a three hour difference. So that's <laughs> 5 a.m. Pacific. Yeah. And basically, so essentially that night I had to like get this memo done, which was the last night with my girlfriend. So she was real upset. I was real upset. And I was just like, man, am I going to marry this girl? Probably not. But at the same time, like this is, if this was like a preview for the rest of my life and this is the feeling I'm going to get into, there's no way I want to do this. There's no way I can do this. Sure. So, you know, again, I stumbled upon bigger pockets, financial independence, real estate, that, those next four months, I was basically just like on bigger pockets while at my job, like hardly doing any work for that job. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, I, I just like jumped right in. That I did a I did a trip to South America, and those it was one of those like revolutionary trips where I was like, I got to get the fuck out of there. Yeah. And so I came back to California. I applied to 250 jobs in one weekend. Jesus. And, and, you know, 249 were like real estate assistant jobs making like 10 bucks an hour in Florida. Mm -hmm. And one was at Bigger Pockets in Denver. So, you know, you know which one I took. Yeah. And um, it was a no brainer. And so from there, like, <clears throat> you know, moved to Denver within, you know, within three months, I had purchased my first duplex, um, house hacked that, and then been able to just like, you know, buy one more each year ever since. And that is what has basically powered me to financial independence. That's awesome. Yeah. I was going to say, Working at bigger pockets, is that like, like, do, do, do they like say, oh, you guys should do this, right? If someone gets a job there, I would feel like working there and the, and the, and the resources they have are just fantastic. Like they tell employees, hey, I have a great idea. Instead of, you know, renting this apartment or doing this, why don't you buy a house and we'll teach you how to do it while you work for us? Is that like, do they preach that? Because that it's got to be like a pretty cool place to work if you like real estate. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely an awesome place to work and I love it here and the people are great. I would say it's less, we don't like talk about real estate all day. Like you might think, um, cause it actually is like a tech business if mm -hmm. it boils down to it. But, um, you know, there are a lot of people here who invest in real estate that like real estate. I'd probably say about 30% of the people here own rental property. And, um, so yeah, we're, we're, we chat about it all the time. We have ideas thrown around. I think the biggest thing is that most people at bigger pockets, aren't the type that are going to go like throw their money away on a BMW or like try to impress their coworkers with a funny car. Like we're talking about the houses we're buying, not about the cars we're buying and the fancy mm -hmm. shoes and stuff like that. So um, that's probably like just like surrounding yourself with kind of like-minded people is really great. But yeah. yeah. I love that so much. Cause even in the, you know, I think if you're in the real estate world, I think people tend to not be as flashy because it's, you know, in order to buy it, you've got to save up to go do it. You know, even, yeah. you know, house hacking, you need less because your down payment is so low compared to other, you know, types of real estate purchases. But nobody's really, you know, flexing on the real estate properties they own because most people are buying B and C class properties, which aren't luxury properties that you see getting thrown around on, you know, Instagram and stuff like that. So I think that culture is amazing. And it's something I try to preach as well. So, you know, I, I love to hear that, you know, that's the route you went and stuff like that. Um, why, why did you decide to go into house hacking versus other avenues? Well, if you look at almost every single successful real estate investor, at least all the ones that I know, they start off house hacking. Mm -hmm. It's just the easiest way to get started. You need the lot, like, you know, a lot of people don't feel comfortable going out and raising other people's money before they've even done a deal themselves. Right. So people say, Oh, you can do this no money down bullshit. But like, you really can't do it when it's your first deal. I, yeah. I just don't, I don't believe in it. Um, and so, you know, you, you're using your own money. You got to save up depending on where you are, maybe like 20 grand and you put that down. It's the biggest investment you ever make. And you just start one, right. You're saving on rent, right? I, I've completely eliminated my living expenses. So that was, you know, a thousand dollars a month in savings. Um, on top of what I was already saving, right? I'm paying down my mortgage. My property is appreciating over time. So you're just becoming really, really wealthy. Um, while you're just like, so you're saving money, you're becoming wealthy and also you're learning real estate. Like you're actually experiencing it firsthand. And so you put all that together, you start to build the confidence. And after you do two or three, you then become like credible and able to then maybe start taking other people's money. You've got a track record now. And now you feel more comfortable maybe using like your own money, the money that you've saved from your house hacks 
to then go buy more real estate and do more deals. And, you know, it's like the velocity of money or whatever, right? And the, that exponential growth where, you know, you start off, that train is going to, you know, when a train starts, right, it's, you know, it's barely moving, barely moving. But then once it starts going, you can't stop it. So uh, that's kind of how money works too. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to hear that because we had one of my good friends on who I went to college with who, you know, similar story, moved down to Raleigh and just started house hacking. And he would house hack one, hold it for a year and then move on to another. And like, that's how he built up his portfolio. And it's everything you just said, basically, like, it's just so easy to get into. It teaches you the business. And now he's at a point where, you know, he came in today and we were just grabbing lunch and we were just talking about like him, you know, hitting debt to income thresholds on residential loans and like starting to look at commercial loans and talking about, you know, maybe him going out and like, starting to raise money and stuff like that. And I know, you know, as a 27, 28 year old, you know, person, it's not always easy to have the confidence, you know, to raise money for something that you don't have a lot of experience in, or even, you know, a few years experience. It's not the easiest thing to do, you know, as long as you have the awareness and conscience of where you're at. So I think it is a way for people to get a ton of experience because you're basically managing everything for yourself and you're just throwing yourself into the fire. So I think it's an awesome process to go through. And it's one I debated about doing a lot for myself. So after I graduated from college, I was going to house hack like a single family home and rent by the bed to all my friends. But when I just started looking into it, I was super nervous about renting the friends because I didn't want money to come in between those friendships and those relationships that I had with people. And I was like, you know, building the wealth is not more valuable than the potential issues I could create with friends. And I didn't want, you know, either a to be worried about the money by not getting it, by letting a friend off the hook or B not letting a friend off the hook and everyone being like, wow, you're a dickhead. So I, you know, and also there's just not a lot of, you know, small multifamilies in around us unless you go to Brooklyn and then it's, you know, you got to have a million bucks or more and it's, not nearly as easy as most other places. So it wasn't, wasn't an option at the time. Um, but I do think it's a, a fantastic way to get started. Um, yeah, for sure. did you ever look at doing it? Uh, it's something I wish I would have done. I, I say it all the time. I, it was, I had a girlfriend at the time who's now my wife. Um, she grew up, it, it was never, ever, it was never really an option, but I always wanted to, whether it was buy a single family house and rent out bedrooms and or buy a small multifamily, four unit, three unit and rent out the other side. I mean, when we were looking at houses, we looked at a duplex and, and I tried my hardest to get her to say yes and she wouldn't buy into it. It's the one thing I wish I would have done that I didn't because I think it's just a phenomenal strategy. I tell people, I tell younger kids, you know, younger kids all the time, not that I'm, you know, 50, I'm 32, but I say, you know, if you could find the right situation, that's the best and easiest way to start with, I don't want to say less risk, you just, but it's it's less riskier than going out, raising money, buying a multifamily deal or a mobile home park, or you, yeah. you have significantly less exposure and you, you live in a place for f- quote unquote free. People are going to yeah. pay, they're going to pay the rest. So you have, you know, your downside is not being able to fill it up, but you're not going to qualify the mortgage unless you can make the payments yourself. So yeah. it's just, you have no downside other than, you know, if it's your friends living there and, or if it's people dealing with people, but if you want to be in real estate, and you don't want to deal with people, you know, that not necessarily the business for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I always say, I always say it's actually riskier not to do it because by not doing it, you put yourself in a position where like you are half to work for 40 years or like if you, you you know something does happen you know you get into a car accident or you need car repairs or something like you don't you may not have three to five grand to just throw out right you got to like go go credit card debt or something right like you just put yourself in such a good financial you build yourself such a great financial foundation through house hacking yeah i think too you also build a really good like real estate foundation because yeah. i'm sure as you've gone through it you've probably done a ton of repairs work information deep dive all by yourself correct Mm -hmm. so the the amount of knowledge you've gained is probably far superior to the amount of knowledge i've gained working on large multifamily deals for the last three years because i'm not out there fixing the drywall i'm not out there replacing refrigerators i'm not doing flooring like i'm almost exclusively on the financial side and all of my property information mechanical information repair information is just by asking questions of the people that handle it. So I get a good understanding, but it's not like 
I went out and I bought the wrong fitting for plumbing. So now in the future, I know what it is. And I learned by making that mistake or by researching it or asking somebody else. So I also know that like myself, I'm personally lacking in those areas where I don't have that foundation of like, especially like material information or like foundational information to build off of to understand. But I also know that the role that I fulfill, I don't necessarily need that because we have the resources to handle that. But I do know it's something I'm lacking. I'm always trying to pick people's brains, especially like our property managers and our maintenance staff. I ask them very, very basic questions. And sometimes I get some funny looks, but it's the only way you're going to learn. So the other part of that too, is by handling all that stuff. I'm sure the amount of knowledge you gained is just incredible. Yeah, for sure. And honestly, I'm like the least handy person you'll ever meet. Mm. Uh, But just by like when things break, I look at it myself and then I bring someone in to fix it, but they're going to explain to me, Oh, Hey, here's what happened. This is how you fix it. Uh, you know, you can just at least, and I can like talk the game, you know, I, I know what the parts are. I know like how, what goes on first and where it goes and all that. I just like can't execute it. So yeah. just being able to like talk the talk to a contractor will just make it so you don't get fucked over later. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. Now when, when the first house you bought, was it a single family house and you rented out bedrooms or was it a small multifamily or a big, what, what was it? Uh, it was a duplex. So it was a, uh, it was a duplex top bottom that I rented out that I, that I bought like in a up and coming neighborhood in Denver. And it was like a mile and a half from the office. So I just figured, I uh, you know, good location. That's a yeah. Good location. I could like, I biked or walked to work. Like when it snowed, I walked when it what didn't, I biked. Um, and so that allowed me to like, I also like rented out my car at the time, basically rented out everything I owned um, just <laughs> to like get that just to build that, you know, cause I didn't have much money at that time. So then, you know, just to make sure that I could house hack and save up another 20 or 30 grand for that next down payment in that one year time frame. And so, yeah, I mean, I was, I was, I did a, it was a top bottom duplex. Um, I rented out the top, lived in the bottom and it still actually wasn't totally covering my mortgage and I really wanted to live for free. So what I ended up doing was I ended up Airbnb out my bedroom and I like made this like quasi bedroom out of the living room where I put up a curtain and a room divider and threw a futon behind that and Jeez. slept behind slept behind the food slept behind the you, curtain for the year. You really slummed it then. You did everything oh, yeah. you could. I everything love that I though because that's if you want like that's that's the thing like if you want something bad enough you'll figure out a way to go do it. 100%. And that's when I hear a lot of people complain about not having something or not being able to do something. If you wanted it bad enough, you'd figure out a way so, to go do it. I had lunch today with the girl that works for us and, and she, I, I sensed yesterday just utter disappointment in her face. I, I, and, I, and I said, I said, so today I said, let's get lunch and let's just, just why? Like, tell me why. Because I knew she was upset. So today I said, you know, I, I flat out asked her that. And I said, what are the challenges here? My credit score is low. I can't sign a loan. I can't do this. I can't do that. I said, but all those objections are easily overcome. You don't want it bad enough. If you really wanted to do what she said, those were all objections that could be overcome. And like you said, you know, it wasn't covering the mortgage in that, you know, that story. And I tell people that all the time. It's, you know, it, why are you doing what you do? Because if, if that is strong enough, you'll figure out a way to get it done. And, and without that, you're probably just waking up and going to work every day or, or whatever it is, but you need, you know, that drive for, you know, got it, you know, fell in love with bigger pockets and the financial freedom and any of that stuff. And that, those are the reasons why, but like that is something that, you know, it was a hurdle you overcome it. Yeah. It might not be the most comfortable situation for a while, but you know, now look at it. I bet if you, you wouldn't have done it any different, maybe tried to do, you know, oh, no. divide the room in half again and, and tried to put yeah. someone on the other side of it. But yeah, put but, someone in the kitchen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> put someone in the kitchen, you know, a, you know, one of those uh, Murphy beds, right? You know, that's not a pantry. It's a Murphy bed. But yeah, <laughs> I think if there's a will, there's a way. And that's, that's the thing that, you know, real estate, you know, you said it, you know, you said it yourself and I say all the time, it's not, you know, you can't take a sprinter and put him in a real estate game. He's going to lose because if you want a wholesale deal and make a million dollars tomorrow, I'm going to be the first to tell you it's possible, but your chances are slim and none. It's, yeah. it's, you'd have to find an 80. We get deals sent us all the time. You know, you know, there's a, you know, this guy works for a wholesale company and this guy works for this. Oh, you got to pay me a commission and it's 3% on a hundred million dollar deal. And I laugh, but it, 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 real estate is a marathon and you gotta, you gotta, you know, the, the first part of the marathon, you know, 
the first part's great, right? You get out of the box and you're like, this is amazing. I'm running a marathon. Four months later, you're like, oh shit, this sucks. But, right. but you, if you yeah. persevere through, you know, three years later, you know, you own a couple houses, your, your passive is offsetting. You know, you could leave a W2 if you want to, you know, that's the place you want to get to. And I think that's the thing that, you know, house hacking, I tell everybody, you know, find that situation and do it. Live in a room and, and, and deal with it for a year. Years go by so quickly. Um, when you look back that it's, it's not that much, you know, taken out of your life and who can, you know, 22, 19, 20, 18 to, you know, when you start getting 30, 35, 40 and you have family and kids, maybe not. But when you're 22, you could live anywhere and yeah. you're really not going to care. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like the longer you can live, like you're in college, the better, the better yep. it is. So, you know, until, until you, you know, have a wife or a husband and kids that basically restrict you from doing this, I would say do it for as long as you can. I mean, it just makes it makes sense. Yeah. I, I agree. That I say that, you know, live like whatever you think you need, cut that in half, try and live on that. Mm -hmm. And, and house hack are the two things I tell people all the time. They say, you know, how can I get started? I'm like, well, what are your, you know, what is your expenses? Try and off, you know, live on half of what you make and, and try and offset that number first. And then the doors just open after that. Yeah. I think though you do have to have a good deal of self-awareness because mm -hmm. when you were talking and you said like, Oh, like it still wasn't covering my mortgage and like I Airbnb out mine, I would have never done that because I would rather have my own, like I need my own space to go to that's big enough to like relax when I'm done at the end of the day, whether I had a good day or a bad day, I don't want to have to deal with an Airbnb person coming into my physical unit. So I would be willing to take whatever it was in payment because I know it's still way lower than what I would be doing or what I'd be paying in rent. And I'd be okay with that level of comfort in my life because it's important to me. It's more important than the cash flowing house hack. And I, I know the, I know the idea of a house hack. Everybody says is to get cash flow positive. I have, I personally actually have a really big problem with that because I think if you can, it's great. But I think there's also something to be said. If your rent is going to be 1500 bucks yep. and you can get it down to a couple hundred bucks a month, and you're paying down a mortgage and you're getting appreciation, that's still significantly better than just renting yeah. and not yeah. owning anything else. Like, For sure. So I, I do think there's a big stigma of like owning a house hacking that is cash flowing. And yes, you should always shoot for that if you can. But I think there's also something to be said for just significantly reducing your expenses, especially if you're in a high, you know, high cost of living place like... Oh. Denver, LA, San Diego, New York, Miami, where your rent could be 2,500 bucks. You can get it down to 500 bucks a month out of your pocket. That's a major win for me. For sure. No, yeah. I mean, and like in the book and stuff too, I always talk about like, like rent savings is a part of your return. Like yeah. if you're paying, and, and I just use like the market for the book, but like if you were paying 1,500 and now you're paying 200 a month, that's $1,300 a month in your pocket. Um, and so I wanted to, I want to touch on like this other thing that I talk about a lot too, is like the, the comfort continuum basically. Mm -hmm. And basically you've got comfortability in one end and profitability on the other. Sure. And basically with, you can, you can kind of get what's going on here is right. Like as you gradually go towards the profit side of that spectrum, you're going to lose comfortability. Yep. Uh, and as you gra and, and it's a spectrum, right? So like you could start off, like I started off probably as far as you possibly could on that profitable side. Mm -hmm. But now that I've got a couple, I'm going, like I've got my own bedroom now, all that kind of stuff. I'm like pretty comfortable where I am. So I like took the hit on the profit. I could be sleeping in my living room still if I wanted to, <laughs> but I'm much more comfortable and my profits are still fairly high. And then the next one I might buy a duplex or triplex. That's like another end towards that comfortability spectrum. And you kind of just like figure out where you land on that spectrum and just kind of like that's where you should be with the house act. But I would say try to challenge and get as close as you can, as far as you can towards the profitability side is that that you're comfortable doing and uh, maybe even push the outer limit of that comfort zone a little bit. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you basically took what I said and made it significantly better. That's, so. what, that's why he wrote a book. Yeah. And, and, you, and you have it. <laughs> well, I, yeah. <laughs> One day, maybe. Yeah. I, don't I, think mean, I'll ever no, be I, I, I was saying today, I have a 10 month old daughter and I'm reading books that are for 10 month old kids and younger. <laughs> and my wife overhears and she's like, you have to stop reading Turkish that you, you don't know what you like. 
it's not making sense. Like reading and writing is not my forte. And people say, you should write a book. I'm like, I'll dictate a book. I can talk, but uh, there's no way like that. Like I would never be able to put it that way. Like, like live like an asshole, just, you know, live as cheap as possible and don't be happy. That's what my book would say. And that, that's just the, the nice way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> there's a market for that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but no, I think, uh, yeah, what, what you've done is just, it's, it's, it's like, like I said, it's the one thing that I didn't do in real estate. When we were looking for houses, I begged, borrowed, and so I, I did everything I could say, you know, buy a four unit, you know, in Brooklyn. And I was a multifamily broker and I saw what was happening in like Brooklyn and Queens. And so let's buy a four unit. We'll take the top unit. I'll even put a, I'll put a, a staircase up to the roof and I'll make a private roof deck for just us. So we'll have space like a yard and, and it's the one thing I wish I would have done. So I, I commend you for doing what you did. Um, and I think anyone listening, you know, read the book, obviously. And if you want to get started in real estate, I mean, I'm sure you can give us a million other ways, you know, the, the sacrifices you made, which I think are really cool. I, I just think it's, it's, it's something everybody should at least try and do if you want to get into real estate. Yeah. It 100%. should at least be one of the top considerations as you get 100%. started. And at least do everything you can to figure out if it's right for you. And if you eliminate it, you eliminate it. There's plenty of other things you can do, but there's no reason not to consider yep. it because it's a great way to get started. Um, can you take us through a little bit more now? You know, you bought the first one, did what you had to do. Um, sounds like you, we didn't really get into it, but it sounds like you bought a few more. Did you house, have you house hacked everything? Have you just bought some as rentals? You know, what, what did you do after that first one? <laughs> yeah. So obviously I, I, I closed in that first property on June 17th, 2017. And okay. so by the law, you have to live there for exactly one year. Mm -hmm. Well, I moved out on June 17th, 2018. So <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty there down behind go. that curtain. But anyway, yeah. So I, I bought it. I bought the second place. This one was a rent by the room, single family house. This one was a little bit north of the city. So it was in a town called Thornton. It's like six, seven miles north of Denver. Okay. The next town up. Um, you still walk to work? I did bike. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, yeah, but it was like 10 miles by bike, but um, yeah, it was, I mean, beautiful ride. I loved it. But uh, yeah, so that property, right, that, that was actually, that actually cash flowed me much better than the other one. Uh, mm -hmm. The mortgage was about the same. It was like the price was lower because it was outside of Denver. Um, uh, and basically I was cash flowing like about a, over a thousand over the mortgage while living for free. So that's incredible. It, that's yeah, fantastic. So, you know, <laughs> you're talking like 16, 1700 bucks a month after like, you know, when you include rent savings. And so like the cash flow on that one was great. And, uh, you know, that obviously, and now the first property is making me money. Right. So you can kind of see yep. how this exponentially grows. Um, and yeah, then I, you know, went ahead and did the same thing again, bought a third, did the same thing. Um, this was time also June 17th, 2019. <laughs> no, that's when I waited a little longer. Not really. I, I started looking on June again, like June, but I, I did a trip. So that come on, you would have the perfect thing going. See how long of a run you could do. You stopped it too. Every year. I know, I know, I know. This one was like, uh, well, the, the seller couldn't move out until like a month later. So it ended up being like 14 months or something, but come on, you could have chipped uh, in an extra five grand on the purchase just to get that get continuation going. Just to get the date, yeah. Yeah, you're going to look back in 25 years and you're going to, God damn it, what, what would have been five out. grand to have that going for 25 years? Yeah, that would been funny. Um, was, it a, the, was it a single family, duplex? What, what was the third one? So this third one was a six bed, three bath in like this awesome like little pocket of, it's called Unincorporated Adams County, which is like in between Denver and Thornton. Mm -hmm. And it has like no rules. So like, the taxes are super low because it's unincorporated. There's no Airbnb rules that Denver has. There's no like occupancy limits or anything like that. So it was like a perfect area. Uh, it was a three bed, two bath upstairs and a three bed, one bath with a full kitchen, laundry room and everything downstairs. So it was basically like two units in a single family, which was perfect. So I just basically like I, the basement was pretty dungeony. Mm -hmm. So I redid the whole basement, made it look real nice and put it on Airbnb. I walled off the upstairs from the downstairs and cause there's a separate entrance to the garage. Gotcha. So now I've got the, air, the downstairs Airbnb making me like between two and four grand a month based on the month. And I got the upstairs making me another 1500 a month while living there for free. So, you know, you're, you're talking like, you know, two grand over the mortgage, 1500 to two grand over the mortgage and, uh, and also living for free. So, um, yeah. And now, you know, and then again, the other two properties are still working for me. They're still appreciating the loans are still paying down. And, um, you know, now I've got like, because I've been still saving and I haven't really allowed my lifestyle creep to happen. I've got 
additional cash that I can now, now one a year is not enough. I need to buy more than one a year. So now I'm getting into, I've got three more um, properties under contract in North Carolina. So I'm kind of diversifying a little bit away from the Denver market just so, and I just like to kind of have some stuff in different places just in case something happens. Um, what yeah. part of Carolina? Um, uh, I'm in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Nice. That's awesome. And those, I'm assuming, more traditional 20% down That's single right. family? 20%. I think I actually have to do 25% down single family. Um, and they just cash flow, you know, they, they don't whip out as much cash flow as these Denver ones, but sure. they're just like, you know, they're not as cute as the Denver ones. I'm not like <laughs> half rent by the room, half Airbnb. Like I'm just like kind of worried about how sustainable this is going to be. Sure. So I just kind of want just some like, I basically want to get as much passive income in North Carolina as I have in Denver through just traditional rentals, just in case the Denver goes to shit someday. Did you, you know? ever on the Fayetteville deals, have you have, do you have any consideration on any military component, like maybe an Airbnb to a military? I don't know how close it is to the base or anything, but. Oh, it's I mean, the, the whole town is military. I know. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. So I haven't done, uh, I've got friends out there and they, they Airbnb okay. like, like crazy out there. I kind of just want to do like, straight traditional rentals. I don't want to worry about furnishing a place. I don't want to worry about everything yep. that's not there. Like I just want to like stop being cute, just do what works that's been working for hundreds of years and um and just like have that be my 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 base foundation that I can always fall back on. Yep. And I'll, I'll continue to take a risk like you know once or twice a year here in Denver cuz that's you know I always say like fi- like cash flow will be- get you financially independent, but appreciation makes you rich, mm-hmm. right? And so I kind of want to play both angles there. Gotcha. No, that's, yeah, no, that's uh, cause we, the reason why I bring it up is we own a property in Jacksonville across the street from a base and we thought about potentially it's an 82 unit and we thought about, you know, renting a couple of units to strictly like Airbnb type airport, air force, you know, uh, Navy, Navy I'm sorry, Airbnb, Naval <laughs> families visiting on the base or something like that yeah. while people are in boot camp. So that's why I ask, cause anytime I hear military, you know, we're not a big military, you know, I have, we have no interest on the multifamily side to be where, you know, major military focus, but those markets typically cash flow a little bit better. And if you buy them right, you'll always have appreciation and cash flow. you know, that's the name of the game. So I, I get it a hundred percent. And, and like I said, you don't want to get cute. I'm sure you could air, but I'm sure you could do different things and make the cash flow significantly more. But you still want to just, you know, down the fairway, play it easy and let it do its thing. Yeah, I don't want I don't want any more work. Like I just want to like, <laughs> buy them. I want to buy them and forget about them. Like yep. that's kind of what I want to do. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I don't want to put words in your mouth. So I want to say what it sounds like I heard, and then correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds like you. F- I don't know if you felt like over leveraged or whatever, but it felt like you wanted to you know diversify and find some stuff that was a little bit less risky, a little bit more stable for your investments and your holdings in your portfolio. If that's true was there anything that happened that made you feel like, or was it just a growing sense of this is too much work? This is too, you know, uncertain. What was that like? Or am I off base? No, no, you're, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. I can tell you um, nothing in particular happened, right? I'm just like starting to grow and grow. And like, you know, you got like 10, 12, 15, like tenants amongst like four properties. Mm-hmm. And you're just like, okay, like, you know, like, likely if you're renting a room, you're probably there for a year. You're not going to like, I'm not going to have a 10 year tenant in a room. Right. Right. And so, and I don't want to, I don't want to like be a property manager. Like I don't, I don't want to do that. I'm doing this for freedom, not to have another mm-hmm. job. So exactly. uh, I, I did find a property. I did find one property manager that does rent by the room. Uh, but if she goes away on me, now I'm stuck. Right. And so I'm like, well, I want to, and I can still, every property I buy, I make sure that they will cash flow as a traditional rental. But, the profits just not aren't nearly as good. And so that's why I want to duplicate my passive income from Denver in North Carolina. That way, if Denver goes to shit, I still got North Carolina and I'm still financially mm-hmm. independent and I can still do exactly what I'm doing. Um, and if Denver doesn't go to shit, hey, I got twice the passive. Yeah, yeah. I win. Like exactly. It's a win-win. Yeah, so. No, I think that's, I think that's really interesting because that was one of the other things while I was looking at house hacking. One of the other things I was always <clears throat> thinking about was because we are doing, you know, larger deals and I don't have to be the only investor and, in, you know, the deals, they're in multiple different areas and all different types of asset classes, B, C, B areas, C areas, stuff like that. I always looked at it as, hey, you know, maybe I would make a little bit more, a little bit quicker by house hacking but I can kind of spread my stuff out and be a little bit slower and a little bit more diversified by, 
you know, co-investing in a lot of the deals we do, you know, maybe it doesn't offset my rent, but I also looked at it as like, okay, if what I rent? rent, yeah, like <laughs> what rent <laughs> and story for another time. Yes. Um, but that's, you know, it's, you know, you can offset it through house hacking or can you just offset it through other investments? If you can get your cash flow up to that same point, you know, maybe it takes you a little bit more dollars and you know, maybe your percentage isn't as high, but you can offset it through other things. And I was always worried about that, you know, diversity aspect. Like I don't have all my money just in real estate. Like I have it in equities and stocks and funds as well. Cause I, that is one of the things that I'm always concerned about is like, what happens if, you know, one part of the market goes South or if one area gets hit with, you know, a hurricane or something like that, or one gets a tornado, like you, I don't want to overly rely on one area or mm-hmm. one type or one asset class. That was something I was always very thoughtful of early on. So that was another reason I didn't want to tie up, you know, in New York, a house hack, you might tie up About a ton 50 of money. grand Absolutely. or more, you know, if you're trying to do a small multifamily, it's, you know, hundred thousand or more, you know, I didn't want to save up for a few years to tie up all that capital in one deal and then it not do what I needed to do. And then I'm stuck having to do all the work to your point about having a second job to do all the work, to work on a property that's not working to live in a way that I don't want to live. I was like, okay, let me, you know, maybe I don't make as much early on, but I think I'm better set up for the future. So that was one of my thought processes as well. So it was interesting for me to hear that you're kind of now a couple of years into it, starting to have similar thoughts or at least take actions on those thoughts if they were always there. Yeah. My, my, I guess my theory is, is a bit similar to yours, but with a small addition in that, like, I, I, I believed at first that like you should try to extract, you should try to get the highest possible return on your money because at first is when you have the least amount of it. Yep. So, and so, and, and, and take it while you can, right? Like if, if, if like, like Airbnb regulations are really bad here in Denver, mm-hmm. um, they're really strict. And so, but I still try to Airbnb it as long as I could. And when I got in trouble is when I then turn it into a full-time rental, right? So like I did it for as long as I could, got the highest return for as long as I possibly could. And then I turned it into a full-time rental. As long as the consequence isn't like going to jail or paying like a tens of thousands of dollar fine, like you'll probably be okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and so now, right now I care less about having like the highest possible return on my money. I care more about like, I just want like, I'm, I'm looking more now just like the passive income number and just <laughs> being like, okay, like how, how can I just like raise that? Like, you know, and if it means throwing, t- only getting like a 15% return instead of like a hundred something percent return on a house hack, um, I'm, I'm okay with it. So it, it's funny you say that because that's the argument. You, you know, when you first start, you, 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 let's call it, you take more risks, right? Mm-hmm. And you want, you want the massive return. So you do deals that you might not do down the road and you know, we, we had a ridiculous deal that we came out of and we 1031 into what on paper was a long-term, it was, a, it was an okay deal. Now it turned out to be really good and we put 10-year debt on it and we still own it. But I tell people now where I sit today, you know, making a guaranteed or as close to guaranteed return as you can with a peace of mind is better than 150% return it's just, you, you have less headaches and less work. And what is that worth it? You know, making thirties and forties and 50% on your money. I'm not telling you that you shouldn't want to achieve that, but the level of work that you have to do to get that and, and where you're buying in your location and all that, you know, there's something to be said about a seven, 8% cash flow, no headache, go to bed at night. And I think that after you buy a couple of deals and you've done it a couple of times, you, you, you're aware of that when you, for when you're the outside looking in, uh, ah, you know, 15% return. That's shit. I want 30. It's like, okay, that's great. But you have no idea the brain damage and the the heartburn you're going to have night after night, you know, achieving a 30. So I think, you know, when I hear people say that, that are in the business, it's it that are doing it in different ways. You know, it, it's like, okay, I'm not crazy. You know, I'm, other people are looking at it the same way. You just have more, you know, you have more, less time to worry about headaches. So you, so you want to be compensated for that. Yep, totally. It all goes back to that comfortability, profitability thing, right? Yep. It's like, you'll, you'll make less, but you'll be comfort, more comfortable and you'll have more peace of mind. So, so I have a question. Totally. When you were applying for jobs and you applied for 250 or whatever it was, yep. and you're coming from Boston, so the weather probably- It was, was California. Oh, no, but, but originally Boston. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Originally Boston. So like Denver, yeah, you know, Denver, you know, it's, it's you know, right not in the mountains, but you, you get some weather. And you wanted to go to Cali. There's a big difference between parts of California and Denver and Florida. 
and you talk about profitability and comfortability. Um, did you find big, you found bigger pockets, I'm sure first, then applied, not applied, then found bigger pockets. Did you care? Because people say, you know, where should I invest? And I tell them, you know, where do you want to go? Where do you want to live? What do you like? Was there any correlation to Denver that you liked or didn't like or had to sacrifice to move there? So when I moved to Denver, I thought the party was over. Like I thought, <laughs> I thought like Denver had appreciated so much. Like it's, it's just old news. Everyone's talking about it. Like I, I shouldn't even go there. So that's why I went to Florida. I was like, oh, the cash flow's better there. The properties are better there. And I mean, I moved to Denver because Bigger Pockets was here. And I'm very glad and happy that I'm here. Like I love Denver. It's a beautiful place. I've been the first time in my life though that I've been landlocked. Um, so that was a kind of a different change, but I mean, mm -hmm. the mountains serve kind of the same purpose as the beach in terms mm -hmm. of like relaxation and getting sure. out of there. So, um, yeah. So no. you were able to, like you said, you thought the party was over. So I, 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 I was hoping for that answer because I want to, you know, people say I can't do it in my backyard. I can't do it here. You moved to an area that if anyone looked at it in 2016, you probably said, yep, the party's over. I can't buy here. And you were able to turn three properties and, and do yep. what you did. So, so here there's always deals. Yeah. What'd you say? say? I say here we are in 2020 and people are saying the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. No, so <laughs> the, the purpose is, you know, people say they can't find deals and the location and I can't do it. You know, it's, it's, you know, that was a, you know, not scripted answer, but it went right. It was yeah. what I was hoping to hear because, you know, you came from, you know, Boston, which is a little cold, there's snow, you're on the water. Then it was California and then it's Denver. People may say, you know, okay, well, you know, he had the opportunity to do that. You know, I don't want to live where it's cold or blah, blah, blah. But those were basically all things you didn't care about. You sort of were going for the work and you were still able to find deals. Were those deals marketed deals or did you use any real estate tricks to try and find something off market or just for regular market? So yeah, with house hacking, you just got to get in. So I, I, all my deals I found have been on the MLS, um, not, not getting cute. Like when, you, when you're doing a house hack, right? Like you're, you're kind of like missing the forest to the trees if you're trying to save like 10 or 20 grand on like getting a great deal right? It's like, you got to get into a property, start saving on rent, start getting that experience, start paying down that loan, start realizing that appreciation. And most importantly, start in that timer, that one year timer, so that you can then get the next one, right? Yep. I, I recently did the numbers and basically compared, like, I wrote an article on this, like, basically compared two people, one person who house hacks for 10 years and does one a year every 12 months, and one who gets like a better deal every 18 months, but they have to try harder, they, it's a lot more work. And the difference is, is the person at the end of the person who buys one a year has 10 at the end of 10 years. The other one has like, is going on six and it's a difference of a million dollars in your net worth. So like, That's, you're, I mean, it makes sense, but it's yeah. crazy when you put it like that. And it's, it, and so like, I, I work with a lot of like, and I'm an agent out here in Denver as well. And I help a lot of house hackers and I'm always like, it's not your forever home. Like you just got to go in and like, as long as the numbers work, as long as you're okay living here for a year, as long as the setup works, that's really all that matters. You don't need to like negotiate 20 grand off. Like I'm, we're going to try the, our asses off to negotiate as much as you can for you. But like there really shouldn't like price should not be a deal breaker when you're house out. So I, I, so that's like golden because I know in this particular situation, when you're house hacking, you got to remember that you're, it's not your forever home. It doesn't have to be perfect it goes more to the business approach to real estate, right? Don't fall in love with the house because it's got a balcony, right? That's ridiculous. If it can get a mortgage that allows you to rent it out to you know, surpass that, if you look at house hacking like a business, you know, okay, the walls are pink and they're not blue. And, and when I was first doing real estate, I had a, uh, a tenant or not a tenant. It was a client that wanted to buy a house in Tribeca, but the budget was like, you know, not even on, Manhattan. It was, it was like fucking Suffolk County. So we, I finally through relationships got a deal and I brought her there and she said, you know, I really don't like the color of this bedroom. I said, if you fucking buy this right now, I promise you, I will personally paint this room for you. <laughs> but when you're house hacking, I'm, you know, it's, you know, people have to hear that. Don't not buy it because you don't love it. As long as you could deal with living there. And like you said, starting that clock immediately, that's, that's house hacking it doesn't have to be perfect. It's not where you're going to live forever per se, but you just want to get, you want to get involved. I tell people, if you want to get involved in real estate, do something, go buy a shitty deal and lose money and learn. And yep. it's the best deal you're going to buy or just do it, get involved, write a check, put the money down and do it. Cause it'll, it'll start 
the snowball downhill as opposed to, well, you know, it's not perfect. It's, you know, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. And that's no why house, perfect. and no deal is perfect, but, but that's why house hacking. And I think, you know, that I'd love to see, you know, because that 10 year comparison is great. Cause I do it on multifamily compared to single family, right? You want to buy, you know, you're capped at how many mortgages you could have. So it, it's a little different, but I say, okay, educate yourself, go buy a duplex as opposed to a single family, then go buy a four unit, then go buy an eight unit, then go buy a 16 unit. At the end of 10 years, how many single families you could have and how many multifamilies, it's the same thing. Maybe it's a little against what you're saying, except if you take 18 months to find a single family as opposed to just buying a house hack, it would be, it'd be the same comparison, just comparing it like single family versus multifamily. But you know, to, to, to sacrifice a million dollars because you didn't like because it didn't have the balcony or face east or whatever the fuck it is. I think that that's something that people have to realize and get over. Cause you, you got to realize when you get into real estate, you know, if you put your little check box together and, and it's extensive, you know, your deals are probably how many deals are going to fall directly in that box. You know, it's few and far between. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have criteria that you will not, I, it's an automatic no, but house hacking is one that, you know, be a little bit more flexible and trust a guy, trust an agent, find the right person, you know, that, that can walk you through that example that either has experience doing and, or can explain to you why you want to get in there now, you know, 20 grand on a mortgage over 30 years. It's an irrelevant amount of money irrelevant. in a grand scheme of things. Yeah. Yeah. I always like, I think like, you know, if, if you're listening to any questions, like what, like I have like one deal breaker and that's like, if the foundation is total shit, Mm -hmm. then I'll back out and I'll tell everyone to back out unless they fix it. But, um, everything else like roof is going to be like the cost of your deductible, right? Like insurance will cover the roof. Uh, any big expenses are likely going to be covered by insurance and any small expenses are by definition small. So like you shouldn't get too worried about everything going to go to shit all at once. Like very rarely does that happen. Like very mm -hmm. low probability. I agree. I, and I think that, you know, the, people's fear is a lot greater than the actual damage. Like even on the multifamily side, when we were talking, we had some structural problems at a building during due diligence. And, you know, the first time you hear it, when you first do your due deal, you're like, oh my God, that, you know, those foundations, you know, it's settling. Then you talk to people, you're like, no, yeah, you put a pillar in there. It's like a thousand bucks or 1500 bucks a building. And you're like, that's not that bad. So yeah. it's, you know, even your worst expenses, like you said, you have insurance, you're covered and your small expenses are small. Your, your big ones you know, if you have that list going in and you know what it is, whether it's addressed by the seller and or it's an automatic walk, those I would agree with. Um, but, but it's not, you know, as bad as you think it may be, it, it's typically not that bad. So, you know, I, I tell people get over it and do it as opposed to talk about doing it because talking about it, it's not, you know, you're not going to get anything done. No, nope. I think when if you think about it too, in all the places you've lived over the years, how many times does something really badly go that wrong? Yeah. Like, you know, you've lived in a home or an apartment for, you know, most people that are going to be listening to this, at least 10 years that you can remember, right? If you're 18, you probably remember probably back to 10 or eight, yep. you know, did you have something major, you know, a catastrophe happen every year that you lived there? No, you might've had, you know, the roofs fixed over that 10 year period, or you might've had a new boiler put in over that 10 year period. It's not like everything went to shit during that 10 year period or that 20 year <laughs> period, whatever it is unless you're just living in a house that hasn't yeah. been kept up right. But if you're a real estate owner and you do the right thing, you should be able to fix a lot of those things before they become big issues, right? Like you're not going to need to replace all the pipes as long as you, you know, pump them out during the winter and yeah. stuff like that. So as long as you take care of it, you know, it's not like all this stuff happens over, you know, overnight. So. Yeah, it's not snapping the finger in the world. And that's typically not how it goes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The emotional roller coaster that people go on when they start to like buy a house is kind of wild when you like, look at it, right? They get all nervous at first and they get excited when they put the offer in. The, the lowest of the low is when that inspection report comes back and it looks like, you know, the inspector always makes it look like the house is basically going to explode tomorrow um, and the roof is leaking and everything is, you know, but it, you know, you got to like, you got to prepare, be prepared for that inspection report to come back and basically going to feel like the house you're buying is complete shit. And, you know, have a good agent, have a good someone or mentor or someone to kind of guide you along and tell you which one of those, those things you need to address now, which you need to keep an eye on and which really aren't a big problem. So. Awesome. So what's, uh, what's next for you, right? You got the three houses in North Carolina, still working, still got the deals in Denver. What, what do you see next for you? Yeah. So, um, you know, my goal is to probably pick up 10 to 20 houses this year in North Carolina. Um, mm -hmm both just through, you know, just the 20% down, 25% down strategy. And, you know, I'm starting to 
uh, use some other people's money to, you know, obviously give them solid returns and also start burring uh, out there, maybe in a different market. Um, and just, you know, I, I really want to just like, you know, get my passive income in Fayetteville at, a similar rate as it is in Denver and also pro probably pick up one or two more properties in Denver this year as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, and also like, uh, you know, like help other people start house hacking. Like, you know, I do it one-on-one -on -one by being an agent here in Denver, but you know, I also, you know, between writing the book and I write a lot of blog posts and all that kind of stuff, trying to educate the masses that I can't really, you know, help out, uh, like one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and yeah, just kind of grow that whole thing. That's awesome. What's it, what's it been like for you as you've started down the path of like, I'm, I'm assuming when you say other people's money, it's been on like the equity side of it, right? Not, a, yeah, not so, using them as debt. Yeah. So far right now, I've just had one partner that we've, uh, it's been equity, but I actually am going to hopefully just go debt. Um, oh, okay. Forward. Uh, I just think it's like, it's easier. I don't want to like get in bed with too many different people, if that makes sense. Gotcha. Um, and just like have a, you know, give them a solid 10% return or whatever, whatever, or, you know, we'll negotiate the terms, but like, um, whatever, 10, 12% return on a debt, I pay you back and you know, you never have to hear from me again, or you can reuse the money, whatever it is. But it's just, it just seems way cleaner and way neater for me than to like, you know, talk about selling and all that kind of stuff. So, so are you talking about their, their like a second position debt or they're the first position? So they would be, I mean, I guess like to like a mortgage. Well, so the idea is that like we would buy, like, like say someone gives me like a hundred grand, right? Like buy, a, it, we would just do the burst strategy. Are you and your listeners familiar with all that? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So basically, you know, with a hundred grand, you can buy a house for much like, you know, 60 grand, you put 20 into it. Hopefully you can refi at 120, pull all the money back out, pay your, you know, pay the, the initial lender and then the mortgage, then the house just becomes mine. Right. Gotcha. So ideally there's never two debt instruments on a house at a time. Gotcha. You just so they're, yeah, I understand. So they're your bird partner, but you're going to, when you get that refinance, you're going to give them whatever percentage on their money and you own it, whatever after. So, okay. Right. That That's makes right. sense. Yep. So why, why, you know, you said you don't want to deal with, you know, too many people and stuff like that. Is there anything beyond that of like, why, you know, is it, you don't want to deal with, you know, investors for the long term. You don't want to co-own stuff with people down in the road in case stuff goes wrong. You know, what has been your, you know, can you talk a little bit more to why you've been wanting to use them more as debt for the short term versus equity in longer term? Uh, I guess just because like I don't really know, like, like in my whole life, like I just want to be flexible. And so I just want to like do things like when I want to do them, kind of how I do sure. them. Right? <laughs> so, uh, like, for example, like if, if, if I make this commitment with someone to like start this real estate empire with them, like I feel like they're not going to want to just do like one deal. They're going to want to do a lot of deals. And that's like the hope, like to grow your equity position, like as high as, as much as possible. And so, but if I decide, you know what, I kind of don't want to do real estate for a couple of years. I just want to go travel. Like that might ruin a relationship that I, I don't, I'm not willing to sacrifice. Um, so stuff like that. Like, I, and, and just, you know, the, the deal structure just gets a little bit more confusing with like, okay, like you know, like what happens when you sell, where do the profits go? You know, is yep. it 50, 50? What is it? It's just like, to me, it's just like cleaner, easier, easier to understand. Um, and that's kind of why I'm doing it. Uh, and like, because I've already got one partner, I don't want to have like multiple other ones. Uh, unless it's Amen like, to that. No, it makes, uh, it's, a, it it's, makes a ton of sense. It's, I tell people all the time, debt is cheaper than equity in the long run. If you buy, if you're doing the right deals and it's what you want to do, you know, equity partners, whether they're, your partner, whether they're investors in the deal, they cost more money pending your structure, obviously, than debt. And like you they said, should theoretically. Yeah, the, That's the yeah, whole reason yeah. you would take an equity position over a debt position. Correct. You should make more. Now, if you want that clean peace of mind, easy, do what you want to do. Here's the collateral. Let me do what I got to do. Let me refi out. You're gone. Here's your return. If you want to do another one, we do another one. If not, no problem. I got, yeah. you know, other people. I mean, it's, uh, it makes sense absolutely. because, you know, if you're someone that wants to retire and answer to nobody, yeah. having investors is kind of still like <laughs> having a job. You have to answer to people, you know, you're responsible for their money, their, you know, business plan and what you told them going into it. Mm -hmm. If all of a sudden, you know, at the drop of a hat, you decide you want to change it. You know, you've still got a, sorry, <laughs> no worries. Good. You still got a, you know, you still got to answer to them. You can't just do what you want to do. Correct. So I get that a hundred percent. And that goes back to, you know, the, 
you know, your profitability, comfortability scale to a certain degree of, you know, you, you want that comfortable, that flexibility to kind of do what you want. And you don't want to, I don't know if it's necessarily maximizing profits or not, but you know, you just, you don't want to have to deal with that. So, you know, you know that, and it's really good self-awareness to be able to structure in a way that makes sense for you instead of structuring it in a way that maybe a lot of people would think to do it. Mm -hmm. You went out and found a different way to go do it, make it work pending. You know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, (laughs) But you know, you found a structure that makes sense for you and you found a way to put it together. So I think that's, you know, awesome. Yeah. I think one thing I want to challenge everybody to do too, is just like, just because everyone is doing it one way doesn't mean it's like the best way for you. Right. Like, uh, in, around the bigger pockets community, at least like the, the buzzword of 2019 was for sure burr because mm-hmm. it was great. Right. Like you can build equity, you've got cash flow, all of this stuff, but like little things people don't remember is, or people don't either, they don't know, or they don't realize is that like, you have to wait for like, after you get a tenant in there, after you do that, like rehab, you got to wait six months before you can get your money back. Yeah. Like, if you're trying to like, I'm trying to pick up as many rentals as possible in this year. Like if I do, if I take a hundred grand and do, I can do two bursts or I take a hundred grand right now and I can buy five single family homes, right? Like I'm going to get more cash flow quicker with less work if I just buy traditional rentals. And I don't care much about like the, the equity gain as much as I do that passive income. Yeah. So that's why like, you know, that's an example of like, think about what your goals are. Think about like what you want to do and just like ignore the noise. If it's going to like actually like change your mind because like someone else is doing it, like take what you know and just do it for your own goals. Exactly. I think you got to work backwards of what you're looking to accomplish, what you're looking to accomplish and figure out a way to accomplish what you want. Now what, what, what you want or what you want, you want to work what works for you and make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. When when I talk to people who are like trying to figure out what Avenue to start on, I tell them to go look up 30 different ways to go do it and not just different ways, different asset classes, stuff like that. Cause there's so many different ways to do it. You're not going to understand what the pros and cons are of each and it'll help you figure out, you know, what you are looking to accomplish. Cause some people also, I just want to make money. That's great. That's not really a goal cause there's a million different ways to make money, mm-hmm. you know, or I want to, you know, be financially free. You start to realize, okay, like pros and cons, like, you're going to realize very quickly, oh, I don't want to be swinging hammers. So you're going to, you know, knock off, you know, live in flips, right? Like you're never going to do that. Um, You know, if you don't want to raise money from investors and equity positions, you're never going to do syndication. So as you start going through the different ways, you can start to piecemeal off, you know, ones that you know you're not going to do and ones that, you know, maybe you could start on. So I think that's great. Um, I think we're just going to wind it down now. Um, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for, you know, sharing your story, your knowledge, your experience, stuff like that. If somebody wants to get a hold of you, find out more about you, stuff like that. Um, what's the best way? And, you know, also give us the name of the book as well. Yeah. So the best way to get a hold of me is through Instagram. I'm uh, at the Fi guy. So the like Fi, like financial independence guy. Um, and then, yeah, the book is the house hacking strategy. You can get it on um, biggerpockets.com slash house hack. And Yeah, that's definitely the best uh, two places for sure. Awesome. Craig, again, thanks so much for joining us. This was awesome. I think people are going to get a ton of value out of it. Awesome. Yeah, great talking to you guys. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.